Okay, so I wanted to start off maybe by just sort of reviewing um, like what we covered so far. Um, you know, like when I was reading this, to be honest with you guys, right? The first time I read through this chapter, I was just a little bit overwhelmed um, because, you know, I know that uh, we've been kind of talking about learning data structures and algorithms on the side. And so I feel like, you know, I am basically being challenged to really remember every single thing like I've, you know, learned on the side about data structures and algorithms like red, black trees, um, B tables, um, remembering hash tables, uh, remembering, you know, the way like these things like improve performance, um, you know, creating like these, uh, you know, structured, or I guess like the sorted string tables, like just remembering the syntax. So a lot of this stuff, like, I feel like, you know, I need like flashcards for in some ways. Cause like, I know if I don't keep it in my own, like memory bank, I mean, if I tried trusting my own brain to remember this stuff, it's probably going to fall out, but like just somewhere else to like store it, you know, and then retrieve it. <laughs> like you need database to basically remember this data. Right. So for your own brain. Um, but yeah, what do you all think? I mean, like, do you guys like have a handle on how these different types of trees work, organization? Are you familiar with like splitting a B tree and, you know, like for insertion and remerging or merging <laughs> branches? These are things like, you know, I just wanted to go back and like review. I think uh, you need to develop an intuition for these things. Um, I think uh, you cannot remember all of this, Vijay. So I think that's, uh, you need to remember the, um, you know, the uh, idea behind it and kind of uh, understand the natural progression of uh, things, right? So, and basically it will help uh, um, if we can understand why we came to this point, if you can de develop that intuition and I have so much noise around me, but uh, so uh, yeah, what I mean to say is, so I don't, I studied B trees back in school, right? The only thing I remember about them is uh, that all the data is stored in the leaf nodes and uh, they have more than, so in a typical tree, you would have one, uh, the the data is distributed throughout the uh, throughout the tree, right? Like uh, in the, it's the contrast in B trees is that the data is only stored in the leaf nodes and the other uh, uh, nodes in the tree serve as pointers to, uh, to that final leaf node. And you can have more than one pointer in a single node. So uh, the rest, I think, if you remember those salient points, I think uh, you know where that's going, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, and these diagrams kind of help, like just looking at this and seeing like, here's a B tree, here's the pointer, here's like, you know, the key, I guess. And then another pointer to, you know, a value and then another pointer to, you know, like if you, in this example, after you add a key, then you have to kind of split the, um, yeah, yeah. the, the row and then make two rows. There was this guy that I was watching um, kind of explain it. He has a lot of followers, actually. And uh, let me see if he has a B-tree on YouTube. Yeah, this guy is really, really, like, like helpful for, like, understanding a lot of these things. Like, I spent some time, actually, on Monday and Tuesday, just watching a whole bunch of his explanations. So... He did a pretty good job of explaining how B trees work and red black trees work, and then like the splitting, you know, and then the merging. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's good to watch those, but like you don't have to remember every single detail. It's, you just need to know that there is such a thing and uh, where mm -hmm. is that most um, um, applicable, like the use case where where you can basically borrow the ideas, like right. For example, the read uh, write ahead log, right? So although the concept is 
specific to uh, databases, you could use it in your application design, right? Like you could, um, if you know what the write ahead log is, that is that that is that idea where you don't actually write, but you actually just write the events and note the note the incoming events somehow, and then later kind of do the job of uh, um, you know bringing your database uh, um, up to basically the to sync your database later, right? So the idea can be used at any level you just need to get those ideas so that's that's where that's what we should um, you know, the, yeah i mean the idea is specific to databases here but like the idea can be applied anywhere you know even in regular life right so um, i think if you get that kind of intuition it's um, we are good we don't have to remember nitty gritty details good good yeah 100% agree <clears throat> Uh, if you, um, I agree to what Amalia said, oh, everything. And then if you see the same ideas being implemented in Kafka, if you will really see, Kafka can be used as a eventual store, the messaging system. Apart from the messages, you can replay it. It is because it stores like right ahead logs. Uh, everything is in the log, so you can always go and replay it from the logs, the whole uh, message structure, right? Uh, historic messages. So, so uh, conceptually, it's borrowed from here in some ways. Makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. I think this chapter is very foundational in that, like, it kind of preps you for, like, you know, some of the, you know, powerful tools out there. Like, I was kind of also looking at Bloom Filter again and just trying to understand that as well, you know. And I get that it's <clears throat> mainly supposed to just kind of give you, like, a look more kind of positive like approximation you know like oh that some data may be in a set you know um so you the point is to kind of like save like unnecessary disk reads right and i guess like that's what all of these things are meant like the whole gradual buildup of this chapter is just to like make it like simpler to retrieve stuff faster like in memory if possible than they're going to the disk you know um like as I got later in this chapter, I even started to see like, you know, data, um, like databases nowadays, like are even just like in memory, like, um, you know, like, because a lot of it is just simpler to work with, um, you know, like, you know, like on the disk, it might will still be in a B tree or saved in a certain way. But then just when the system starts up, it immediately creates like this in memory data that basically all the applications can just work with and not have to go to the disk very often. So um, they're saying like, that's like an advantage of like having like a modern like database. So um, any other thoughts? Like what are you all like thinking about like from this chapter? Definitely like to know. How about concurrency or I guess like at a base level, isn't it about like read and writes? like and the optimizations around all that. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I haven't gone in depth like you, uh, you have gone trying to understand every detail because um, I don't envision myself ever to be uh, um, going into a path of becoming a database developer. Mm -hmm. uh, if I want to become that, that uh, in-depth knowledge of this would help. Otherwise, having that foundational knowledge of what it is and what data stores and the data model, which database to choose what. And it's never easy, right? Because uh, these days both have complementary features, right? Uh, what suits the use case, it all depends on a lot of factors at that point. So being able to assess and make the decision is what um, this chapter is all about for me personally. Um, I don't know if uh, others have a different opinion. Yeah, so I think for me, it's um, it has we made made me think in terms of disk rights, and mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean as application developers, you don't think that, right? So um, yeah, so basically, how uh, compaction like how, when a particular right to a DB is taking. So we uh, as application, we use uh, DDB as our uh, backend uh, database, right? So we sometimes. Um, 
see that there are uh, for no apparent reason we see uh, io um, failures right you know it's a regular there's no uh, load uh, traffic load to justify the uh, you know increase in the io disk errors and stuff but i think uh, reading this i i understand that there's some background compaction kind of thing happening so some yeah. uh, housekeeping happening that so that could trigger um, such a thing so i mean and having that um, i don't know how useful that is but uh, but yeah at least like you have you kind of get some um, ideas where the issues might be so we engage the whoever is the database owner the right like uh, the right way having that right. knowledge definitely helps uh, even if uh, you know you can't solve it <laughs> at least from a promo doc you can use it most of the l6 also they don't know this <laughs> if if yeah. that's icing on the cake for you <laughs> yeah 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 i mean um, it kind of makes us uh, get the um, complete uh, holistic understanding of how the systems work right so yeah right right and i feel like so just for clarification wasn't compaction basically just a thing like for the hash it's like if you use the hash um index like compaction applies but if you use a b tree you know then so if you use any kind of ssm table right or lsm tree um mm -hmm. like i guess the sorted string tables don't really care about compaction i mean they care about compaction i'm sorry and then the b trees don't because you do like a bunch of overwrites instead like and you just keep um all of the keys um in a table but then you don't like i guess like the main difference is like in a tree you're not appending you're just overriding whereas like in um a table you have to append or if you're doing it like directly to disk you're appending because appends are faster maybe yeah, some clarity around it's that. also um you can expect um uh, uh I mean, unexpected uh, higher, like th your average stays low, but like um, there are some writes that uh, that take tend to take longer than you would expect them to be. You know, you, even though it's a single write, you uh, write to a single, you know, node or something, you, you basically can have, a, uh, you know, the triple effect. It might cause uh, the parent nodes to be split up and basically the rearrangement of nodes all through the tree, right? Like if you have, if uh, you had to create a new node, at the leaf level then it can right. have a um, so yeah so basically you the average stays low but um, even there there is a risk of uh, your p90 p1 uh, you know p99 or so that number can, can still be uh, much higher than your average mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i i was uh, reading a section here for recap too as well and um I think they were saying that like if you were to pick a database, you know, um, and you wanted to kind of like compare like an SS table to like a, a B tree table, like like the SS tables are faster for writing, whereas like the B tables are faster for reading, right? Because um or would it be the other way around? Like, let me just take a look here. No, you're right. So B3, there's, um, um, so the, uh, the depth is only like max four on a 250 terabyte, uh, um, system, right. Mm -hmm. Um, but on uh, S, the, on the LSM, um, uh, data structure, you basically append. So writes are fast. There is no right. figuring out where to write. Right. And it's this compaction process that happens in the background that makes the data easy to sort of retrieve after the fact, but it takes time. So that's one thing, like if you were to consider a database that's, you know, founded on like an SS table structure, um, right. then you just have to worry about like this compaction and sorting in the background. But if you were to like do some kind of app or website or something that does just a lot of reads, then maybe a B tree is more, the standard, um, and I think that's what like B trees are powering SQL, right? Is that like the modern solution? That's what I think I got from this chapter as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I think like is that a pretty good review of uh, everything we talked about from last time so far? 
Yeah, I think that's a good summary. But like the ideas wise, what did we get from, you know, in terms of ideas that we can apply in our day to day job is like the uh, writer headlock concept and then bloom filters. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. So bloom filters sound like magic to me. I have to understand like the mechanics, how it works. Um, I agree. But it's good to know that. Um, uh, that there is such a data structure which could just tell if a node is, if a you know um, a key is available without actually traversing the entire thing. Right. So, like, what I got from the write ahead log part was that it was meant for helping like recreate the tree, right? Um, because B trees could be um, unreliable if the data fails. Um, you have like there's stuff that happens, right? Like if you were to split a page because insertion was over full, you ran out of memory, then um, that can be a data just operation, you know, like the database can crash. So you have to do with this write ahead log to kind of like you write it to like another data structure and then like you recreate the tree, you know, um, when you restart the disk or restart the, the server. So um, that was my yeah. understanding of write ahead log. So you're kind of like like, writing ahead and then, but you're still maintaining like the read structure in a tree because reading is faster. It's like that O log N, you know, if you keep balancing that tree correctly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, basically it's like a write ahead log is like synchronous uh, thing, right? You just, you write and then you note that event and then asynchronously handle um, the actual persistence. So, um, I mean, the idea is like, you can apply it at application level. We do that all the time, right? So mm-hmm. another uh, uh, concept here is compaction, different types of compaction, uh, the leveling compaction and the size steered compaction, right? Um, so I think uh, it's not elaborated, um, but yeah, so that I think in the previous page. What else? Curious. So basically, compaction is how to kind of merge um, and remove the duplicate uh, keys in the LSM trees. So, um, so depending upon your uh, write patterns, you can choose the write compaction technique. So that again, like that's what we should glean from it, like the idea behind like what are the different types, what are the uh, techniques, right? So if it is a time sensitive, uh, if, it, if it is a time event log, then um, you would want to use, uh, uh, I believe, I think it's, go. I think the previous page. This one, right? I don't know. I, in the previous page, can you go to the previous page? Oh, this one, <laughs> maybe the one after. But anyway, so um, yeah, it's, um, so I, actually I didn't, um, let me read up a little more. I think I read uh, kind of on our high level. I don't remember the exact detail, but one of the technique is about um, if you have heavy reads, right? Um, you know, yeah, if, if it is a read, read intensive, um app then you would want to use uh the size tier size level um tiered compaction and if it is a right heavy um application then you would want to use a level uh you know uh the level one so the reason being that um the level uh tiered compaction um red, uh, focuses on reducing the number of segments um, so you don't have to kind of re, uh, re do, I mean, do this compaction multiple times. You don't have to, um, if you only have one segment and the one current set, like the segment that you're writing to currently, and you have only one older segment, then you only have to kind of merge two segments. Right. But, um, if you have many segments, then you basically have to do this merge sorting multiple rounds. So there's that difference in technique how it's applied right <clears throat> by the way i found the size tiered compaction in the <clears throat> um leveled compaction <clears throat> so, yeah i just highlighted it so essentially yeah um it's about just kind of like um i guess like it's an optimization you know like um basically for compaction, like you're saying, right? Um, 
you know, the newer and smaller SS tables are successfully merged into older and larger SS tables, whereas in level compaction, the key range is split up into smaller SS tables and older data is moved into separate levels. And that allows compaction to proceed more incrementally and use less disk, disk space. So it's all about just kind of um, reducing the oh, disk okay. space. Thank you. Yeah, I think I got it not mixed up then. Yeah, basically, um, if I think a diagram would kind of put this um, more right. uh, yeah. mm -hmm. intuitive. Let yeah. me do that research. I'll take that action item and kind of find a good pictorial representation of what they're like. Where is this more appropriate? Um, yeah. Which one to choose? Yeah. Yeah, and that was kind of like to my point earlier. I think like this chapter is like kind of trying to push towards the idea that you don't want to do a lot of disk um, storage um, if possible. Like it would make the program a lot slower. Um, so you want to like reduce as much disk space as you can with your data and keep most of it like um, in memory so that when the application starts up, you can just like hit that, you know, um, database, get the results you need pretty quickly, you know, and then, um, you know, be on your way. If you have to do a lot of disk seeks, then um, it's just going to take a lot more time. I guess like that's, what do you all think of that point? Um, was that a question? Were you, you were asking the question? What was uh, oh. Um, oh, no, I was just saying, like, in summary, I feel like this chapter is, like, pushing towards, like, the idea that in memory is better. Like, if you are going to design a database, um, then, yeah, yeah. like, if you were to just put everything on a disk, like, right, like, in the beginning when we started this chapter, it was so much about, like, just, like, directly saving to a file right, like here, save to the file, like on the system with like these simple appends. But as we started getting more complicated, we started creating memory structures with hash tables, then trees, and then creating like this optimized like memory structure that is just like much more efficient at reading or writing. Um, and so then like, it still works with the disk and it compacts like old information into the disk, but it keeps like a whole bunch of pointers and references to those places in the disk. And so ultimately the chapter is kind of like pushing towards this idea that an in-memory application for a database, mostly in memory, is much better than like one that just directly saves to disk because it's, it's going to be much more faster and optimized, right? Like hence the B trees and all these techniques. My intuition was B trees. It also actually has a disk access because as soon as we write something, it has a disk access. So mm -hmm. these are in memory indices which have some pointers to actual database records. Correct. So, yeah. 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 That, that's the point of like these like pages, right? Like here's. Yeah like a page number and here's the reference to that or here's the key you know and here's the reference to this value so and then like one other thing too is like the larger this row i guess like you know obviously the more runtime but like i guess if it's like a very small row then it's not too difficult for the database to kind of go in here and read through some like look for some range of keys. That's like another thing that I got out of this chapter um, that searching for ranges is possible with the B tree. Whereas like with a hash table, um, you kind of have to just go key by key by key there. You don't really get ranges. Um, and it all comes together. I guess like we can kind of go forward, right? Like, so um, if you start looking at like the SQL statements, um, so select from restaurants where latitude is greater than this range and you know um, latitude is less than this range and longitude. So like they say that you know a standard B tree cannot answer that kind of question efficiently. Um, but then like you get into like um, specialized indexes that 
I guess like this one was saying that um, rather than to have a like basic, you know, um, two, three key, two, three tree, right? And again, I also need to read up on this. Um, you can have like a specialized kind of um, search for creating like 2D indexes or 3D indexes. Um, but yeah, uh, I think it's all about like, like the, the main thing about the B trees versus the Ellison trees, right? Like, is that you get like this range um, ability to search for a specific thing and it maps to the SQL that you usually work with. So um, let's go ahead and jump to this part. I think we left off last time on B tree optimizations. So I'll go ahead and start here if, um, if everyone's okay with that. Um, so, so B trees are basically, you know, as we've been discussing, like another optimization for um, holding data. Um, you know, and um, it says here that for optimizations, right? Like these, so B trees are pretty much like the industry standard at this point um, for for holding data. Um, like SQL is backed by a B tree, um, but for um, optimizations, right? You can do things like um, uh, use the WAL, the wall, like you were saying for crash recovery. Um, you know, and then like some uh, databases like LMDB pretty much use like a copy on write on scheme instead of a wall. Um, and so they just, instead of like, um, you know, overwriting, they just create a copy and then they put that like in a different location. Um, let's see here. Um, packing more keys into a page allows the key to have a higher branching factor and fewer levels. And that was something I was trying to say like earlier, like um, when you have like um, more keys, then you have less of like a tree height and you're able to kind of um, basically, you know, like, provide the, these key ranges here, provide enough information to act as boundaries between key ranges. So one optimization is saving spaces by not storing the entire key, but abbreviating it. So, uh, you know, like rather than saying, hey, you know, here's where this key is or that key is, you just give ranges. So those are optimizations. Um, pages can be positioned anywhere on disk. There's nothing requiring pages with nearby key ranges to be on disk. So, um, and here it says, if a query needs to scan over a large part of the key range in sorted order, that page by page layout can be inefficient because a disk seek may be required for every page that is read. So the B tree implementations pretty much try to lay out the tree so that leaf pages appear in sequential order on disk. Um, LSM trees write large segments of the storage in one go during merging. And so it's easier for them to keep sequential keys close to each other on disk. So like one thing about LSM trees, you know, is that um, they have that sorted principle, right? Going back here, um, right? Um, you can't append a key immediately. You have to first do the merge sort but then like keys are sorted and easier to find. Like if you're looking for a specific key, um, B trees are better for ranges. Um, you can add additional pointers to this tree. You know, each leaf page can have references to sibling pages on the left and right, which allows scanning keys um, without jumping back to parent pages. Um, and then like, there are fractal trees that can basically reduce disk seeks. Again, like the whole idea of reducing disk time. Um, here I made some highlights about like comparing a B tree to an LSM tree. LSM trees are typically faster for writes, whereas B trees are faster for reads. Um, you know, a B tree must write out every piece of data at least twice, though write a head log, which you mentioned, Amelia and then to the tree itself. So this is a little bit of an overhead um, for a storage engine. 
And so that might be something to consider, like when you're when you're working with the database, like you just have to think, okay, well, this is what's going to be happening in the background. You might be okay with that. Um, and one thing that I just saw here on the side, right, was that LSM reads, LSM trees are slower because they have to check for different data structures and SS tables are, you know, have different stages of compaction. So maybe highlight this as well. Um, you know, then we have over here on this side, um, multiple writes to the disk over the course of a lifetime can um, kind of destroy your SSD, right? Like if you have something that's writing a lot and you're working with SSD solid, disk, solid state disks, um, you can wear out the solid state disk through write amplification. So it's just something else to consider. Um, and this is like, if you have, you know, an SS table implementation, um, in write heavy applications, the performance bottleneck may be the rate at which the database can write to disk. And so, um, you know, if you have write amplification, um, the more that storage engine writes to disk, the fewer writes per second it can handle within the available disk bandwidth. Um, so- I mean, at the, like on the top, he seems to say that um, the, LSM tables have um, suffered from this write amplification where because of compaction, they have to rewrite a lot of stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of times. And here he says, um, LSM trees are uh, typically able to sustain higher throughput than B trees, partly because they sometimes have lower write amplification. Um, I would imagine I would imagine the other way, right? Oh, the SS um, the LSM and the log structured are basically the same thing, right? Those tend to have higher uh, write, write amplification than B trees, right? Right. I think the thing that throws me off about log SM or LSM, the term is like, when I hear log, I think of O log N, but it's really just logging, right? Is that like the appending term <laughs> yeah, terminology? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's so, basically appending style of writing. And right. this is the basically balanced tree kind of writing, right? Right, so right, yeah. You would be writing this compaction thing happens with the um, log structure, log, basically those LSM trees. And that's where you would see this right amplification. Um, then I don't know if it's a typo or I'm not reading it right that he says it's the other way around. Yeah, I think this is just something to kind of like go out and research on the side, you know, and just, yeah. you know, again, like it's like I've been saying, it took me some time to kind of like go and really wrap my head around this chapter. Um, and I still feel like it will because with all the terminology that we're going through, it's not something you can just kind of like sit down and be like, okay, I'm going to read this at nighttime. It's like a good story, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have to like, like copiously take notes and like even kind of like look at the notes you're looking at and saying, did I write the right thing down? Um, um, you know, and even like, uh, as I was kind of like watching this and there was also another, um, one by the MIT, uh, open courseware. I think I shared that in the chat. Um, both of those professors, right? Like they're all like, you know, very, um, smart people, but they said like many, many times, like, you know, um, oh, like you have to practice. You can't just passively watch this. It took me many, many, many times to like even wrap my head around it. So those are like MIT professors saying it to you, right? Like, and so I can share the link. I'm just looking for it right now. Um, this one, this is the other video. So, yeah. I think the deeper you go into the details, the harder it is going to be to remember. So I think we should not do that. Yeah, it's not an easy subject. So I, I highly recommend just kind of like, you know, getting your head around like the whole like rights, you know, and like the way like the rights are happening, appends or, you know, like like the balancing, the B trees, the splits, the merge to be able to understand like things like right amplification or, you know, um, how like the disks can handle, like how much like rights a disk can handle, um, bandwidth, um, you know, sequential rights. 
stuff like that, right? Um, you know, I can keep reading here and I think we can keep reading to just keep going through the chapter because ultimately like it's about the intuition, right? That you want to form with this book, not get like a PhD, <laughs> although that could be your goal as well. Um, but yeah, um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Elsom trees can be compressed better and it does often produce smaller files on this than B trees. Um, B tree storage engines leave some disk space um, unused due to fragmentation, which makes sense. Again, like if you think of how a B tree is, right? Like some uh, nodes won't have any like data information. So that you have like more unused memory. Um, and when a page is split or a row cannot fit into an existing page, some space in a page remains unused. Um, LSM trees are not page oriented and periodically rewrite SS tables to remove the fragmentation through compaction. And so they have lower, lower storage overheads, especially when using leveled compaction. Or so again, like if your need for a database is to have like something that fits um, into like specific application disk space, then maybe an LSM tree is the way to go. But if you have a lot of data, like Amazon does, right? Um, that's something that they pride themselves on, right? Then it makes probably more sense to use a B tree backing database, um, you know, with a good caching strategy. That's kind of like my take. Um, many SSDs, the firmware internally uses a log structured algorithm to turn random writes into sequential writes. Um, so the impact of the storage engine's write pattern is less pronounced. Uh, however, lower write amplification and reduced fragmentation are still advantages on SSDs representing data more compactly, allows more read and write requests available within the input output bandwidth. So these, again, like this probably is like the most important part of this uh, chapter so far, just kind of like knowing the difference between like what we started with the hash indexes, then the B trees and the LSM trees, um, and then like the way those things work. Um, some downsides, right? Like I kind of, again, just highlighted here is that, um, you know, performance um, can, like the compaction process itself can sometimes interfere with performance. Because, um, you know, you have like another thread just sort of running and doing compaction um, with an LSM tree. So it, it can easily happen that a request needs to wait while the disk is finishing inexpensive co compaction operation. Um, you know, the response time of queries to log structured storage engines can sometimes be quite high and B trees can be more predictable. Um, like, and I was, uh, you know, as I was reading this, I was thinking like, you know, where does this all apply? Maybe, you know, like um, in, in games, they might use LSM trees more because like, you know, they don't have huge, disk space to work with, or they assume that they don't, so they probably need to store things in an LSM tree. Maybe we could see some research around that. Whereas like websites probably on the other hand use B trees. Um, basically another thing that I've highlighted here is that finite write bandwidth needs to be shared between initial write, logging and flushing a mem table to disk and the compaction threads running in the background. So um, compaction has like the issue with bandwidth, um, writing and logging. If the write throughput is high and compaction is not configured carefully, then the compaction may not be able to keep up with incoming writes. Uh, in this case, the number of unmerged segments on disk space. Disk keeps growing until you run out of disk space and then reads slow down. So SS table based storage engines do not throttle the rate of incoming writes. If the compaction cannot keep up, you need to explicit monitoring to detect the situation. Um, so those are sort of the downsides of LSM trees. B trees, um, each key exists exactly in the pla one place in the index, whereas a log structured storage engine may have, again, LS <laughs> may have multiple copies of the same keys in different segments. Um, B trees are attractive in databases that wanna offer strong transactional semantics, like relational databases, transaction isolation is implemented using 
locks on keys and a B tree index, those locks can be directly attached to the tree. So I'll just highlight here. Mm, yeah, I think it makes it possible to do the locks, right, with the B tree because you can kind of ensure that no other writes are happening to the same node. Right, like you can manage concurrency better like with a B tree than you can with an LSM tree. Um, let's see here. B trees are very ingrained in the architecture of databases and provide consistently good performance for many workloads. So it's unlikely they'll go away anytime soon. Again, industry standard. Um, log structured indexes are becoming popular, but there's no quick and easy rule. Um, then the next part of this is um, other indexing structures. So, so far we've been just talking about primary keys, but then there are also um, secondary indexes. Um, just for review, a primary key use, uh, identifies one row in a relation table or one document in a database. Um, secondary indexes, um, you know, kind of allow uh, you to reference multiple, um, you know, um, items in the same table. Um, so like user ID is like one kind of secondary index in an SQL database where you can find all the rows that belong to the same user in each of the tables. Um, he says that, you know, secondary index can be constructed from a key value index. Index values are not necessarily unique. There might be many rows under the same index entry. Um, and so either make each value in the index a list of matching row identifiers, like a postings in a full text search, or by making each entry unique, appending a row identifier to it. Um, B trees and log structured indexes can both be used as secondary indexes. Can we pause and understand what that means? So basically he's saying a secondary index is constructed um, from, can easily be constructed. The key value from, index, yeah. And the, mm -hmm. A secondary index, the characteristic about secondary index is that now um, there is no one node for a given key. There could be multiple nodes, multiple results show up for the same um, for the same key, right? So earlier mm -hmm. with the, so far we've seen that like one key should resolve to one value. Now, value, correct. It's not, it's not true anymore. So the indexed values are not uh, unique. So... There, there might be might many rows with the same, the same entry. So vertex just kind of means like another like node, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like in your graph. So this node or this vertices might have like that da same data or may point to the same index. So um, make each value in the index a list of matching row identifiers. So like in your, when you're like making a key point to like value, you just kind of like have like a matching row, like an array of those matching identifiers. Okay. okay. Um, so now instead of the actual value, now you have a bunch of pointers that uh, point to the, uh, those values that uh, you want. Okay. Correct. Correct. This is where it starts getting like kind of like crazy. This is what I was trying to point out. Like with this thing, this is how like you would have the, the multi-dimensional indexes because um, you're, but we'll get there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. Like when you kind of think of like how this stuff is actually really built because it's, it's doing some really crazy tricks. If you thought like what we were reading so far was pretty difficult. It's, it's like another level. Um, but yeah, so let me see. I, I lost my page. All right. So, um, so you can make each value in the index, a list of matching row identifiers or make each entry unique by appending a row identifier to it. Um, so let's see here. The key in an index is the thing that queries search for, but the value can be one of two things. It could be the actual row, so document and vertex in question, or it could be a reference to the row stored elsewhere, right? So this row, stored elsewhere is called a heap file. And I guess like if you think of like C++ or the heap, you know, being memory outside of like the stack, 
probably the same thing. Um, it no, stores. It's the same thing. So let's. Yeah, it oh, just named. That. Okay. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like, not, right? Well, let's see. I mean, it could be some similar idea. Let's see. No, basically, what they're saying is this place where um, they'll keep a list of pointers. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe in a heap you would. You would well, the, put your the reason I'm saying that, yeah, is because like then like in a heap, you can store like a reference to like a big object, right? Whereas like, and then like you can just kind of like get like all the properties on that object, like in the heap. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, you know, I'll admit I'm wrong if I'm wrong, but like. <laughs> yeah, I remember heap as like the place where all the dynamically allocated storage is kind of kept. Yeah. Um, but yeah okay but i it doesn't uh, hold reference to anything else right right um so let's see here um it says that it stores data in no particular order right and that's kind of like another big thing about heaps is that it just may be append only it may keep track of deleted rows in order to overwrite them with new data later the heap file approach is common because it avoids duplicating data when multiple secondary indexes are present. Each index just refer references a location in the heap file and actual data is not kept in one place, right? So this is just becoming like, um, like an index refers to locations. So like rather than values, it's just references. Um, when updating a value without changing the key, the heap file approach can be quite efficient. The record can be overwritten in place, provided the new value is not larger than the old value, like probably in bit size. Um, <clears throat> the situation is more complicated if the new value is larger, as it needs to be moved to a new location in the heap where there's enough space. In that case, either all indexes need to be updated to point to that new heap location of the record, or a forwarding pointer is left behind in the old heap location. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so in some situations, the extra hop from the index to the heap file is too much of a performance penalty for reads. So it can be desirable to store the index row directly within an index. This is known as a clustered index. So store the indexed row directly in the index. Um, that's what the InnoDB storage engine with MySQL is. The primary key of the table is a clustered index and secondary indexes refer to the primary key rather than a heap file location. So the secondary index points to the primary key. The primary key contains a clustered index of references to um, places on the disk in the heap essentially. Um, a compromise between a clustered so, index. So basically, what they're saying is uh, in the clustered index, they, they will store the pointers as well as the value in the index. Is that what they mean? It can be um, it can be desirable to store the index to draw directly within the index. So the values are stored within the index and not pointers anymore. Is that what they mean? I think possibly, yeah. Like maybe we can just kind of like go through this one more time here. Um, but essentially, That's like, correct. yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's too yeah. much for the disk, right? Right. We're trying to reduce the amount of time we go to the disk and keep things in memory. That's kind of like but the memory. whole idea of, I mean, this uh, indirection thing happened only because we were not able to fit it in the memory, right? If you could not fit pointers in the memory, how can you put the value in the memory? I mean, uh, you are going to hit um, the limit faster, right? with the actual values being stored in the index rather than Values are not stored in, even in secondary index. It's just a reference to the uh, new object being stored somewhere. Values are not stored in the index, only the reference. Pretty much like how we create an object and then have a reference, multiple references pointing to it, right, in, in Java. Mm -hmm. But here they seem to, what does it mean when they say it can be desirable to store the index to row? directly within an index. 
um this is known as clustered index there is something going on here um kind of have to read up yeah they either store the entire row or part of the row depending on what the some of the queries maybe you just need some particular columns so they say they either store a row all row data or part of the row data yeah it says here it says yeah. a compromise between a clustered index it stores all row data within the index so maybe values and a non clustered index is storing only references within the index um mm -hmm. and so this is called a covering index or an index with included columns which stores some of the table's columns within the index so when you make a query <clears throat> you can just use the index alone to be um the source of truth um so the index is said to cover the query so it's i guess like maybe the the idea here is, is this is just a strategy for um you know being able to answer a query um and it's really meant to just kind of like pre like almost like a cache like just kind of cover the read um they require additional storage and can you know add overhead though but i i would say like go through this part you know if you want like to reread this section and just kind of like watch some videos or something just to get like an other take on it because like for me again like when i read stuff i i need like multiple sources of people telling yeah. me the same thing for me to kind of like understand it i can't just like read one book and kind of be like okay i got it <laughs> you yeah. know yeah i think we should um, two things that we need to kind of do some uh, parallel reading is this cluster the uh, read concept and the compaction mm -hmm. um yeah i will read up and then enlighten you guys <laughs> next class <laughs> for sure um i just saw that it's 8:30 here as well um so yeah like i said um i think this chapter is pretty big um you know just kind of take your time with it go through it try to really digest it um we're almost there though towards the end i think we'll get to the end faster than we did with chapter 2 um it ends like after here i think let's see summary i think right. it's um, after every chapter i think we should kind of dedicate one one session to actually writing out the notes um i mean i, I try to take time out <laughs> and try to make the notes but it's not happening i think if it's better if we can kind of um write collaborate and write the notes before moving on then i think we have better um we'll have better gra grip on stuff otherwise okay. it's going to be a slippery slope would you would you like um i guess uh have you given everybody edit privileges on this is it the same link first off is it yeah it's the know? same link but i've not been doing anything there so it's the okay. same link it has the permissions for everyone um we could just you know like just like screen share and kind of um, write out the notes uh, collaborate and uh, keep the notes up to date so okay okay sounds good All right. Well, so uh, we'll meet up Friday, and I guess like before um, everything, uh, just kind of take your time again, read through, and um, ask questions as always in the WhatsApp or Discord. All right. Yeah, after you are supposed to talk about bloom bloom filters next class. So yeah. Okay. Maybe we can have like a lightning talk on bloom filters if anyone wants to do that. I read on bloom that. filters. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm ready to give my talk whenever you guys are. Ready, so. Absolutely. Okay, nice. Maybe next okay. class first few yeah. we can talk about them. Yeah. No way. Okay. Sounds good. I'll see you all Friday. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.